Welcome, everybody. I'm so delighted there's so many people here. My task is to engage you tonight on the Venice Biennale. And in order to do that, um, I've, I've, I went to the Venice Biennale this year and was so blown away by the number of things that I saw, I thought, this needs to be shared. So I spent a considerable amount of time putting stuff together and trying to find a way to share the things that I had noticed. One of the things that's impossible to do in the Venice Biennale is to tell you about everything. So what you've got from me tonight is a very personalized and a very partial telling of, this, of the Venice Biennale. And when I say partial, I mean it's only a small bit. And I also mean that it's my partialities that are on display here. It's the things that interest me. And so you're going to join me, in a sense, with, on a journey through noticing certain things, making connections, feeling what the artists are doing, what the curators were trying to do, and trying to make sense. Because this was a remarkable biennial. Um, it was, it's basically a hundred years of feminist art practice. Because it's not just about contemporary art. It's also picking up on a long history. And that's the journey that I want to take you on. But I thought it might be good if we just do a little bit of context setting. Um, wherever you come into Venice, whether you come in by air, or whether you come in by land, or whether you come in by train, you always have to get off that vehicle and get onto a boat. You always, and the romantic idea of Venice is actually quite true, though I've never been on a gondola. Um, you always end up in something where you're crossing water. And to get to places, you're always looking across water. And so it's, it's a most remarkable place in terms of the dissolving of the, the, the types of norm that we're used to. In Venice, you don't hear cars, you don't hear traffic. And whilst we have had COVID, so we've had those quiet streets in our own cities, it is a really remarkable experience to wake up at night or in the early morning and only hear the boats and the things that are happening and maybe the odd motorcycle. Um, it takes you and gives you room to think about what's on display, what the various things are that you're looking at in a different kind of way. It takes you apart from your normal world. So this particular series of talks, the two of them, the first one I'm going to be dealing with one venue, the second one with another venue. For those of you who, who may not know um, Venice, there's a, a map of it and the, the, um, there's two venues, the Arsenale and the Giardini. And so the first talk that I'm going to be talking about is sort of around here, the main building, most of the stuff in the main building. And I'm going to be trying to make some sort of sense out of what I saw, and I'm taking you on that journey. So when you arrive, you probably come on a Vaporetti, though you may have come on foot if you've been clever about where you've chosen to stay. And in this particular iteration of it, um, the posters are dominated by eyes. Wherever you went in Venice, in this particular Biennale, there was the eye watching you. And they've been extracted from various works on the actual exhibition. 58 countries, 213 artists. Gives you a good idea why I can't tell you about everything. I'd be standing here just giving you a list and you'd be bored out of your minds. So, as I say, we're going on this journey about trying to think about what we're looking at. And the eyes and the eyes. Eyes looking out considerations about insight and intuition, considerations about blindness and perception. And that, those were critical things about trying to make you, or the viewer, begin to think about the ways we see the world, the ways we look at the world. So these were these very large iris paintings, I'll very briefly reference them later, by Ulla Wiggen, and the five historical time capsules that became the nubs to guide the viewer through the Venice Biennale. They had a variety of quite curious names. Witch's Cradle, Corpus Obit, Technologies of Enchantment, and then a very long-winded one, though simple when you begin to read it, a leaf, a gourd, a shell, a net, a bag, a sling, a sack, a bottle, a pot, a box, and a container. For those of you who read Ursula Le Guin, you might recognize some of the references there. And then finally, the seduction of the cyborg. Because what happened in this exhibition, key texts were chosen. And then those texts were used as jump off points for thinking about how we've made our world and how we are going to make our world. 
Um, the three main texts were Leonora Carrington's Milk of Dreams, and I will extrapolate in a little bit of detail on that book here. Um, it's a children's book. Um, Donna Haraway's Cyborg Manifesto, and Ursula Le Guin's The Carrier Bag Theory of Fiction, which is where all of those containers came from. The curator, Celia Alemani, gave some very succinct um, directives in the press releases as to what she felt the exhibition was about. And she wanted us as viewers to consider how artists were dealing with the crises that we find ourselves in. The crises of our world. Why have we got to where we are? What are we going to do about it? How are we going to be resilient? How are we going to survive? What are the threads that can be drawn together there? So for her, and this is straight from her press release, um, there are three themes. The representation of bodies and metamorphosis. The relationship between individuals and technologies, the notion of the cyborg. We do live in a post-human age. Um, and the connection between bodies and the earth. We obviously are in a, in a strongly dominated by technology world, and we've become very used to it. The post-human age, everything, we are actually extending our bodies into the most extraordinary capacities. You can talk to your friend across the planet. You can see them as they're talking in real time. The capacities, the prosthetic capacities of the human body now are, are beyond the imaginings, except in sci-fi, maybe 50 years ago, and it's all now becoming so accessible to us. Critical in this exhibition for Alemani was the fact that she chose it quite radically to be a deliberately female orientated exhibition. So that either 90% of the artists are female or gender non-conforming. And of course this idea of, a, of an exhibition as big as the Venice Biennale as being 90% female, it was the sort of center ripple through the world. Oh my God, the standards will go down. Um, <laughs> Alemani pointed out in the first 100 years of the uh, Venice Biennale, and it's been going since 1895, it was 90% men, and sometimes 100% men. And it's only in the last 20 years that the percentage of female artists that have been included are, have risen to sometimes 30%. So it was a definitive statement to try and look at the spaces that have been ignored um, and not taken into consideration. So it's a particularly complex exhibition um, as part of my own uh, research, I'm interested in the work and produced by, by female artists, by gender non-conforming artists, and when I went to this exhibition, I was staggered by how few people I knew on the show, and that's a bias that I have in my own research. And as I became more um, au fait with what was going on in the exhibition, I began to realize why. And it's one of the things that I want to unpack as we move um, through the images. Throughout the exhibition, there were these posters. Um, in this particular case, each woman writes her story, utters her name, shapes her world. Stories, narratives became a core element here. And that's, there's an old feminist adage, you know, the, the, the personal. The personal is political. The private is political. And the uttering of stories, the telling of stories, um, we are used to his story, not so much her story. And that's what part of this exhibition was very, well, the whole of the exhibition was very much strongly dedicated to. After a couple of days there, I, I posted on Facebook, and if you'll do me the uh, excuse of, or I'm going to take up my own piece of text that I wrote on Facebook, an exhibition full of body, sex and visceral entanglements, corporeal excesses, madness and abjection, witches, mediums, trances, and altered states. Soaring beings from ethereal realms, earth creatures, peat and humus, and soil, dirty fingers and ragged minds, incarcerations and freedoms of many kinds, all churning together, the brutal and blunt, the violent and bloody, the fragile and delicate, the ephemeral and light of touch. It can get one all shook up, but also settle the soul. The days on the Venice Biennale were really quite exhausting. They give you a ticket. It's for one day at the Arsenale and one day at the Giardini. 
In the past, they used to give you a ticket for three days, and you could use it wherever you wanted. I really objected to this forced um, one day, one day, and actually ended up having to buy two tickets so that I could spend two days and two days. Um, in some of the press releases, they said, oh, you need three to four hours to go around. I don't know what they were on when they said that. <laughs> Um, because it takes all day and you literally stagger out, and I didn't get to see it all. So again, another reason why it's, um, it's, it's a partial view, but I still hope um, a full one. Um, I probably also at this point, before we kind of actually enter into the exhibition, just indicate that there's a need at certain moments for trigger warnings. The exhibition had some very violent um, images on it, some very violent images from the Ukrainian war, um, <clears throat> some violent sexual images. And so I will probably flag that. Know that you're not forced to look at the screen. You can look away. Don't feel like you have to be obedient and keep staring. Because I had one friend of mine who, who I gave this talk somewhere else to, and she said it took her 24 hours to scrub her mind of some of the images that she saw. So please know that you can look away. When you walked in from the very entrance, this is the first thing you almost see, or the, almost the first thing you see, and it's a pile of sandbags. And it's, what, it's the space that was given to Ukraine by the Venice Biennale authorities. Um, and it's symbolic of the preservation of Ukrainian culture. It never fails to amaze me how when people are at war that somebody somewhere thinks we've got to preserve the things, other things that matter. Not just our lives, not just our food, not just our supply chains, but the things that are actually going to help us recover later. And we know that the Ukrainian war is a highly complex thing and there are a lot of different debates about who's doing what and why and so forth. And I'm not really getting, I'm not going to get into the politics here so much as just to indicate that the protection of culture has been stated by the Ukrainians as something that they're going to need. It's what they've fought for in their separation from Russia and is what they will need to have if they're going to continue. Afterwards, they're seeing, seeing uh, obviously, uh, hoping for an end to the war and their own sovereignty again. Um, what struck me there is the valuing of creativity, the valuing of culture. And in so many countries in, now, you, don't, you take art out of schools, you don't see it as important. How many people said to me during COVID, art saved my life? And that wasn't necessarily from artists. Either they were listening to music, they were seeing plays, they were reading books, they were learning to draw. And these were the things that gave people a place to rejuvenate their beings. And I'd really like to just sort of underline that. And as I say, it's one of the reasons why I think it's so nice that we've got these kind of gatherings happening here. So next to the pile of um, sandbags were these columns. And because Ukraine was in crisis, their artists couldn't come. They couldn't get things across. Well, in fact, they did get, and I'll show you one piece later, where they did, somebody brought it across the border in, a, in the boot of their car. Um, but what they did was they put up these, these columns, and then artists in Ukraine were faxing and sending, not faxing, but sending digitally um, images, normally watercolors, normally pencil drawings, and they would simply print them out in poster form. And one of the ones that I, I thought that caught my eye right at the beginning was this, this little one, um, which I thought was really very tender. They had been shelling close to us during the night, it said. And right at the bottom, dogs forgive people. We know how sensitive dogs' ears are, and that the shelling for any creature is normally a million times more than it is for us. It's another reason, by the way, I, 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 li I like Deer Park. They let us bring our dogs here. Um, so worth supporting on that. Companionship, multi-species, thinking across the borders and boundaries of what determines how we are as humans. These are some of the more tricky images from, from those columns. Um, you'll see on the left, lower left, an image clearly of a, of a young woman who's bound and the legs of soldiers around her, the implication being clear. Um, this flying bird with these bombs dropping down. And the idea of this space that is under, under threat. 
some of the works, artists turned their, their, their skills to new areas. Um, this particular artist, Lucy Ivanova, turned it to camouflage nets and found that she was making camouflage nets, making drawings of camouflage nets, and hoping like crazy that the, the planes that were flying overhead were not going to, in fact, spot them. Then there were other works like this. Apparently, a young mother wrote on the back of her baby all the contact details, her little child, all the contact details. So if they became separated, it would be on the child's body. And this became a, a kind of a, a little a meme that went out, uh, and because it's a very good way of making sure you can't lose it, in a sense. The lower image is a particularly um, dramatically violent one, but I took this image for the combination. In the background, of course, we have all the Phoenician art viewers having their glasses of wine, having their nice lunch. Really, it's a fabulous thing to do. It's, so, it's such a wonderful thing to do. And yet we're doing it in a world full of crisis and disruption. And so it's, 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 um, it's important to keep those things in mind. We know our world is an imperiled world, wherever you are. At the moment, we're in this gorgeous venue. Um, we're enjoying our evening. We're being cultured, perhaps. And yet, at the same time, we know we live in a, in a country of extraordinary inequalities. We know we live in a world of extraordinary embattled areas. And we also know that um, the COP discussions, the Conference of the Parties, the UN environmental discussions that are running at the moment with governments are extremely um, tough because we do not know, well, we've, we've, we've kind of moved past the tipping point. Our world is in trouble and we've put it there. And how do we find our way out of that space? Or how do we respond to that space? Or how do we become resilient in that space in the face of that? So next to the, um, the visitors having their wine and enjoying themselves, um, Right across from there is the Russian pavilion. Now, any of you who've been to the Venice Biennial will know that every nation has its own pavilion. And normally, it's done in an architectural style that reflects the history in some kind of a way. The Germans have kept rebuilding their, their particular pavilion all the time. The artists are always dismantling it. I'll show you some of that later. But the, this is the Russian pavilion. But this time, it did not function. The artists who were going to be ex ex exhibiting there, the curator, they withdrew as an ethical decision. And so the Russian um, pavilion was, was empty. And one of the, I think it was the curator, speaks and says, um, there is no place for art when civilians are dying under the fire of missiles, when citizens of Ukraine are hiding in shelters, when Russian protesters are getting silenced. So that was the ethical position of Russian artists in sympathy with the Ukrainians. So you have that sandbag monument to the preservation of culture. And then the front of the Giardini, there's always something on the facade. And in this particular case, it's quite a classic um, sort of modernist classicism on this facade. And there's always something that disrupts it. In this particular case, there were these sculptures on the top rank, and it was a little difficult to see them, but they're a little bit like the kind of Grecian sculptures that would have been decorating those surfaces, except that they're not. So there were a whole variety of different creatures from the sea, mainly um, sharks, with missiles, playing music, are surfing, the, the, the seagulls, by the way, are real. Uh, <laughs> uh, and it's kind of a, kind of a weird sort of popular uh, uh, um, imagining, a collision of, of different expectations here, one of which sort of sends up the whole seriousness of it and at the same time reminds us of this collision that is actually wiping out so much of our world. What was interesting is how much the figure of the animal dominated in this particular uh, Biennale. Entering into the Giardini, you're faced with the, a, a full-scale elephant. And uh, entering into the Arsenale, 
there's this, this, this totemic, iconic black goddess. We have the language of Africa absolutely in the foreground of both venues. And that in itself was a very interesting um, element of the exhibition. Simone Lee's Brick House, and I'll talk a little bit when I go in next week, um, discuss the Arsenali, I'll discuss that in more depth. And Katerina Fritsch's um, Elephant, 1987. You already get to know, if, if we think of the um, Venice Biennale as a contemporary art exhibition, it is, but it's one informed by history. So not everything is made in the last 10 years. As I said, <coughs> this particular exhibition, it's the last 100 years of practice. And that play between things also evokes the presence of the female. This is a little detail from a Louise Bourgeois drawing, which was made a very long time ago, and of course encapsulates the idea of the female body as the domestic, as the place of the home, but of course also as the place of lost, the lost individual. There is no individuality. There's an anonymity there. Uh, the elephant is a female elephant and was chosen by Alamani because she wanted to um, reinforce the fact that if we look at the way that elephant society organizes itself, it's a matriarchal one. So what you're getting is an underlying of the female vocabulary and the strength of female leadership in these spaces. If you step further towards the elephant and you start looking around, you'll see the collision between the language of the elephant and the elephant is derived, it's, it's, a, it's being cast off a taxidermied elephant. So it has all the, the surface detail that in fact an elephant would have close up. But it's this curious, slightly otherworldly green. In the roof of the pavilion that it's in, there are these um, quite particular paintings, um, working within a European tradition, and it's, it, it's put there on purpose to make you remember that, of course, Venice built a lot of its um, wealth on the northern scapes and, and the eastern sides of, of Africa. Venetian maritime industry, um, its mercantile um, uh, places of, of, of engagement were North Africa, East of Africa, and then the East. And its vocabulary in the city is dominated by lions, um, St. Mark's lion, and the lion itself, it's part of the, uh, the flag, the insignia of the flag. And at one point they had uh, an elephant before the Biennale, before the very first Biennale, they had an elephant in the Giardini, known as the prisoner of the Giardini. And so all of these little, little stories start to, to, to come together and to begin to tickle each other, as it were. Making sense of it all is, is something that every viewer, in a sense, is, is, is encouraged to do. And when I try and make sense of something, I have to sometimes um, take time. Um, I was given a flag, the insignia of the flag. Uh, and at one point, I was they given had, I had to, uh, an elephant. I was given a very lovely elephant. book before the very by first a friend Biennale, of mine before I left. They which had was an elephant Constantino in the Giardini, sketchbook known as the prisoner. And so I, when I was there at the end of every day, so I would try and draw some of the things that I had to, thought about to, and to seen. And, and so what I thought I'd do, I'd just show you a page of how I work out how making sense of things are. So that's the Constantino page, which allowed thought to link and move across. And, and just the first section, when I try and make sense of the elephant, I have to sometimes. So these are, these are um, not drawings I would show people normally. Um, I'm just showing you how I, I was think given and how, it's, how I'm trying to put things together. And once I started to do that, oh, I like. I thought that was an interesting word. Oh, I like that. And then I'm beginning to go. Oh gosh, look how many times that funny crimson red comes up. And look at these strange um, forms that are beginning to relate across each other. And then I'm mm. beginning to think. Oh, those are the connections. So. To go back to the actual title of the uh, Biennale, The Milk of Dreams, it's a wonderful title. It's, it's such an evocative thing, the kind of semi-translucency of milk, its warmth, its blueness. Um, and as a, as a milk of dreams, it's, 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 a, it's a wonderful title. It comes from Leonora Carrington's 
little collection of short stories for children. Um, when we arrived at the Biennale, it was only available in Italian. On the last day, we saw it come in in a box um, at the Peggy Guggenheim Museum, and we literally leapt on it in the English version. And I was so glad that I got it, because it was actually quite hard to understand why an entire biennial should have been based on a series of children's stories. Now, uh, Alemani said, oh, it's in the press releases, she talks about the, the hybridity of objects, the capacity to transform, and so on, and there's this place of the imagination, which all makes sense. But when I started to read the book, I thought, I'm not sure that that's what I pick up from it. In the exhibition itself, um, a small space was dedicated to the book. A little passage was painted yellow. Some of the watercolors of Carrington's were on display, as was one of the books. And I'll show you here um, one, of the, one of the watercolors. Now, Leonora Carrington is one of the uh, better known female surrealists. Out of the artists that I did know on the show, she was one of them, along with a number of others. That was one of the critical vocabularies of this Biennale, surrealism. I have to say that Sarah Lee is not my favorite terrain um, in terms of picture making or image making or art. I love what the writers write about it, this engagement with the unconscious, this need to find a vocabulary that bypasses the logical and the constraints and the prison of the logical. But often the visual images can kind of, it's, perhaps it's a matter of taste. I'm not normally drawn to them, but what was so interesting about the exhibition was how it got, certainly myself, and I presume others, to look differently at the presentations, at the production, and why certain things would be drawn and presented in a certain way. Now, these, these watercolors were drawn and painted for Carrington's kids. So they had a particular place that they were being directed. That's great. You look open the book, and there are 10 stories. Um, and they have titles, I don't know if those of you at the back can read, but I'll narrate. Headless John, The Monster of Chihuahua, and images of small dogs getting large, um, The Horrible Story of the Little Meats, The Nasty Story of the Chamomile Tea, and The Disgusting Story of the Roses. I mean, you can hear the level, the, the age of the child that these are directed towards. You know, when, when poo things are the things you laugh at, and, and the disgusting is the thing that, in fact, the um, children want to know and go to squeal to delight about it. And it's full of that. It's, it's, these, are, these are nasty little stories. Um, these are some of the drawings from it. Um, the one on the left, George ate them all and his head grew into a house. George was a, is a character who likes eating walls, and his father is concerned and takes him to a pharmacist, and the pharmacist gives him this house, house wall pill, Mooty, and he eats them all in one go, and then his head grows into a house. Now, his father's appalled, but George is very pleased with his head. He likes it. Um, another one, John. Um, John has enormous ears. And I'd like to, in fact, read you the story of John because, well, partly because probably many of you have not had a story read to you for many years. Um, but also because it'll give you an idea of the texture of, of her writing. And many of the stories are to do with heads, heads that change shape or get separated from their bodies. So if you'll bear with me. Settle down, children. <laughs> Headless John. The boy had wings instead of ears. He looked strange. Look at my ears, he said, and the people were afraid. During the night, John liked moving his ears. One night, he moved them so much that his head flew out of the window. With no head, he couldn't even cry. So he got up, and he ran after his head, which was flying from tree to tree, as if it were a pigeon. John's mama, who was looking out of the window, saw her child running around at night. Where are you going? My head took off. <laughs> what a pity, 
said the poor woman. I'm not quite sure how to inflect that. Ha <laughs> ah, ha, that's right, laughed the head. And John ran very fast, but he could not catch his head. He kept flying along, laughing. John saw a man. Lend me a string, said John to a man. Here, take it, the man said. John caught his head and went home, very tired, with his head jumping along behind him, firmly tied to the string. Mama, he said, stick on my head, please. And his mama stuck on his head with chewing gum. <laughs> but because it was night, she stuck it on backwards. <laughs> Don't let your head escape again, she said. And from there on, John was very careful. Presuming that John went on living his life for the rest of his life with his head stuck on backwards. <laughs> I read the book three times <laughs> before I kind of, I was going, how can you do a biennial based on the book? <laughs> what? And as I say, the, it seems to me, and I'll, and I'll kind of lead you through the story, that it's about losing your head and finding your head. In one of the dominant vocabularies of this Biennale was madness and incarceration because of madness. And then it raises the questions as to why are people going mad and how are they being incarcerated and how do they survive that if they do and what comes out of it. So throughout the exhibition there were a lot of headless bodies, a lot of places where people lost their head in clouds, had their heads ripped off, um, I began to sort of collect them because they seemed to be everywhere. And in some cases, they revealed a very particular kind of edge. This, this particular artist, and I really will hesitate, I won't, I won't attempt the name, please just look at the name because it's a Polish name and I don't want to embarrass myself really badly, um, was a series of photographs called Mama. And that is Mama in a little trolley box. The artist did it like this, except that the image on the left is not her, it's the sculpture. It is so naturalistic that it's really quite hard to see that it's not a real person. And the only clue is right if you look very carefully and you'll see the hands um, in relation to the side of the body. And it's actually a model. And so, what, so it's cast from the artist's body and then the given it's painted to make it look um, as realistic as possible. And then it was given to her daughter to look after and to engage. And so the little girl does all the sorts of things that she might do um, with her doll, except that her doll is her mother. And this inversion of expectation around the relationship between mother and child is very, very curious. In this case, she's putting on the makeup onto her mother's face, much as a child might do when they go into their mother's dressing table and, and put it on themselves. And there's a kind of space where the mother, the mother is, is dismembered, she's, she's a bust, she's a head without a body, and she's been given to her, her offspring, her young child, to be looked after. The vocabulary of the damaged mother and the the distortions of the, the right way that things should be was very strong in the exhibition. It ran through all sorts of areas and comes up time and time again. Um, I'm going to show you some Paula Regos shortly, and that's a very strong um, subject or theme in, in, in her work. The dismembered head, though, also occurs in the animal world in this Biennale, and it's um, sometimes really quite brutal in the way that it chops and cuts and spikes and spears. So making do without one's head being properly in its place is a recurrent theme. The witch's cradle is the first space which is the historical capsule that you, that you, well, you first meet. Um, each of the historical capsules were very carefully designed they called a company in specially to do it. And in the witch's cradle, the floor is, is carpeted up, almost up the walls. So it's got slightly muted. It's also under um, 
the ground. There's no windows, there's no outside view. It's a very internal space. And it takes its name from a 1943 film. Maya Darren made a, an experimental film called The Riches, which is Cradle, from which this image is taken. And of course, most of you probably probably played some form of the um, cat's cradle, which is cradle the string, where you can do it with yourself or you can do it with a friend, and this place where how you interact using the string that connects but also can entangle is the place um, of interaction. So it's the witch's cradle is also, of course, its wider, um, possibly associative space, the place where witches are born place where they grow up, the place where they're nurtured, the place where it becomes the nursery of um, the witch. And that is a subversive um, reference or a reference to the subversive mood or spaces or capacities of women over history. Um, probably most of you are familiar with the persecution of women as witches. The moment a woman is labeled a witch, she's dangerous and she can go through all sorts of um, forms of torture, which doesn't matter if she's proven innocent or if she's innocent, she dies. If she's guilty, she doesn't die, and then they kill her. Um, it's, a, it's a very brutal history against women. Um, and it's often related to women's interest in being naturopaths, herbalists, healers, um, being in conversation with the natural world and the capacities of the natural world. Just referring once again to that little strange comment that you could get through this exhibition in, two, in three to four hours, this exhibition itself could take you three to four hours to get through. It was really, really intense. These are some of the artists in that room. And there were copious texts and copious supporting analogies and various things that you were meant to go through. And as I say, this is not the whole list um, and when I went first through this, I kind of thought, oh, I only know, like 10%, what is going on here? Um, a lot of, there were, well, not a lot, but the, the room held artists who'd been marginalized. So there was quite a strong reference to artists of color in America. And, and to read up some of the stories was quite fascinating. This particular piece is, is, a, is a, a small bronze maquette, the piece on the, on the right, the piece that looks like a harp. And um, it was originally realized in plaster for the New York World Fair, and it was five meters high. That's a very large sculpture. And they never had enough money to actually make it in the bronze. And then the plaster one got destroyed and we're left with this little bronze maquette. But that is a major work of art in 1937 by a black female artist in New York. That was a really interesting story to hear. Of course, the, the better known, perhaps, Josephine um, Baker and, and, and other artists in that space. And also people that we, women that we might not necessarily consider to be artists. Arti people, women who were um, involved with the esoteric arts, um, witchcraft, uh, psychic communication, medium, spiritualism, trances, uh, also, that space of madness, hysteria, and mental disturbance, uh, parapsychology, automatic writing, practitioners, people who had a certain popularity at some point, sometimes they were debunked, sometimes they were revered. They were the core of this exhibition and were really into, they went back as far as the 19th century. And the, the image on the right is of a, of a, of a, of a healer's hands. So it was very much um, women and voices at the margins of society. All of these voices that do not fit the rubric of logic, which tells us you know, how we should understand the world. And it, that which is what becomes critical about the witch's cradle. It's the languages we tend to dismiss. Oh, it's just a dream. Oh, she's a crackpot. Oh, she's mad. Oh, she's disturbed. Oh, it doesn't make sense. You dismiss it. It doesn't fit. You don't give it credence. So there's this kind of hum around the outside of a rational society that is not finding a place to take purchase. And it didn't surprise me after a while that a kid's story book should become one of those marginalized voices brought to the fore because it's another place of dismissal. It's just a kid's story. 
It's just for the kids. As we go through the book, though, I'll just reveal a few things that might make you think slightly differently. In The Witch's Cradle, there was also this piece. Um, it's a very tiny snippet of archival film, uh, Mary Wigman from 1930. Uh, an artist working against the conventions of classical dance and classical display. So it really is a, like a, like a two-second snippet. And we're meant to have volume, but we don't have volume. I don't know. I don't know what's happened to the sound. Anyone know what's happened to the sound? Not that it's greatly um, complex. <laughs> it's actually quite simple. Just not classical, just not harmonic, just not nice, maybe. And artists who, many of them had changed gender, changed for a variety of reasons. Um, we know that a lot of female artists are often dismissed. Their, their husbands become more famous if they're artists. Um, this particular artist, Chiminova, adopted the pseudonym Toyen, inspired by the French word citoyen, citizen, because citizen was regarded as a genderless um, name. And one of the things she did was illustrations, also a marginalized area of making art. And this was very much about this particular one called the shooting gallery. It was about war and about the need to protect spaces. And so it represented a, um, quite a lot of, of, of different kinds of damage, again, in a kind of story-like way. Um, animals taking the brunt, of course, of, of the destruction. So to go back to um, Carrington's book, The Monster of Chihuahua, as I said, I had this image of small dogs getting big. Um, this was the drawing that accompanied it. And part of the story, uh, the monster had no residence, no husband, no mother, no father, no children. But it had six legs, a golden jewel and pearls. And there it kept the portrait of Don Angel Vidrio Gonzalez, the head of the sanitary department. I wasn't sure if he was a man who dealt in shit or whether he was a shitty man. Um, the monster said, fives and fours, fives and fours, fives and fours, five plus four, five plus four, five plus four, and after that the monster made up the total. Perhaps that's what we always do. Anyway, all of us make up our own totals. We see the logic and then we go and do something else. How we make sense of our world. And in this particular story, when I had done a little bit of digging around Leonora Carrington's own life, I discovered that in fact the monster of Chihuahua, Chihuahua was not necessarily a reference to a small dog. It was in fact the name of the street that she lived on. She lived on Chihuahua Street. And that was in Mexico. And she was living in Mexico after having had really quite a torrid life journey. She was born to uh, landed gentry in England. She was apparently a rebellious child um, who really did not behave as she ought. She got expelled from two schools. She apparently bunked her, her audience with the queen. Um, so you can tell the kind of family strata in which she was living. And she escaped to, when she finally could, left her school, escaped to, to the continent, to France. And in France, she met uh, Max Ernst, the painter Max Ernst, the German surrealist painter Max Ernst, and felt they, they fell madly in love. He was 27 years her senior, but they apparently had a really passionate romance, and they painted each other. Uh, the painting in the, in, the, in the middle is Carrington's painting of, of Ernst, and this is one of, one of his paintings of Leonora in the morning light. They were, they, they definitely were synerging off each other and a very famous painting by Max Ernst, this one on the right, you can see that it's in a gesture towards the Carrington portrait of him. And he then takes that image and creates it, this is meant to be the bridal one, and that's meant to be Carrington underneath that, that red robe. So they, they, kind of, they kind of came together. 
Ernst and Carrington, as I say, had this passionate affair, but it was in France at the time of the war, just at the beginning of World War II. And at a certain point, the French arrested Max Ernst as a German and possibly a, um, uh, somebody, you know, a spy. Carrington was very, very distressed by this arrest. Um, Ernst had some good friends in high places and his release was secured. Then the war did break out. Germans came into France, into Paris, and then they arrested, the Germans arrested Ernst as a degenerate artist. Carrington lost the plot at that particular point because obviously the Gestapo were far more scary than the French were. Um, and again, Ernst was lucky. He, he, through various means, was whipped out of France and went to America, leaving Carrington behind. Um, at which point she went to Spain to escape from France and, and the Germans, but she was in a complete mess. She was a complete state. And she was incarcerated in an asylum where they gave her electric shock treatment and uh, various anticonvulsive drugs. Um, and her mental health was completely disintegrated. Ernst, in America, seems to have not paid much attention to the distress that Carrington went through. In fact, one of his friends in high places was Peggy Guggenheim, who was one of the top collectors of Surrey List art. And he eventually married Peggy Guggenheim. So we have Carrington, who's, who's not holding it together at all, but the mental health system is not helping. Her parents eventually go, this is also not be good for her. We should get her out to a place of rest. And they decided to ship her to South Africa. I don't know if you know, but South Africa apparently had health farms in the 40s for people with mental illnesses. And they put her on a boat, and they sent her to South Africa, except she skipped ship, as, she had a, as was her wont. And she skipped ship in Portugal. And she met a Mexican and went to the Mexican embassy and married him so that she could get out of the country and go to Mexico, where she spent pretty much the rest of her life and was the center of an alternative artist community. And she lived in Chihuahua Street. So the monster of Chihuahua is Carrington. She's the one who is this unknown quantity. And so in order to, to try and get closer to this, I looked at this drawing that she had in the, in the Monster of Chihuahua, and I thought, I actually traced it, because very often if you trace something, you begin to know how it's put together and what it's doing. And as I traced it, I realized there were very particular resonances in the different structure of the drawing, that the moon in the right-hand side was very much the kind of tip of, the, of her hat, and also the arc in which her eye was held, the eye socket of her eye but that within the eye socket was a star. So it made me wonder if, is she star struck? Is she seeing stars because she's been so beaten about by events? Is she moonstruck, as in deeply in love? Or is she just plain loony? And it seemed to me that this little drawing, which is inconsequential, it's in a child's book, was far more meaningful than I had first realized when I began to understand her life story. Um, and so the beast, the beast of Carrington's stories, if it is the woman herself, if it is her place of dreaming and seeing, it begins to make sense to all the other artists on the Biennale who suffered mental illness or madness. So and the surrealist males seem to have had quite a large part to play here. Um, Leona Delcourt, who renamed herself Nadja because it meant hope, was in love with André Breton. She kept sending him all sorts of letters. They had a passionate relationship. It wasn't a one-way affair. It was a passionate relationship. Loving words, doodles, and she always signed it with a kiss. And then he eventually dumped her, and she lost the plot. She was also put into um, an asylum. Carol Rama, she 
said that she chose insanity. And I'm not sure how much you can see in this particular image, but it is one of those sort of trigger warning ones if you start to look closely. It's very violent. It is a woman who's had her legs and arms taken off, and she's on a hospital bed. And it's the kind of incarceration with the straps on the bed that holds uh, mental patients down. Um, so it's a kind of double incarceration and uh, disability and imposed disability. But she said that I am truly a premeditated lunatic. Mine is a trained folly. Um, perhaps if you know that um, Rama's mother herself was in an asylum, her father committed suicide, and her uncle was the maker of artificial body parts for the war wounded, you'll realize that her own context, her family, close family context, was also a particularly difficult one. The following image is a trigger warning image. It is a, it's a, it's a, it's an aggressive, aggressive and violent one. I won't leave it on the screen for too long. Um, it's Miriam Khan's drawings of sexual abuse. And the image on the right, you may not initially, when you see that punch, realize that it's coming from a female body. And so what we're looking at is this hit back, this space of hitting back and violence. Um, What I would like you to keep in mind as we carry on through this journey is the veracity held in images that seem imaginative, perhaps playful, um, perhaps broken, perhaps crazy, and that there might be a meaning that has to be sought in there to be understood. I'm going to, I'm going to go deal with one more artist before we take a break now, so that you can go to the loo or order, a, have another glass of wine or whatever it is you want, stretch your legs. So from this image, which is in the center of the uh, Milk of Dreams, outside in the national pavilions, the Danish pavilion held an item that was very much resonated with the Carrington image. Um, it was this one is a lotto. The work is called We Walked the Earth. And the situation as you walked into the space, it was like walking into a stables, and there were these extraordinarily uh, naturalistically rendered forms of centaurs. First one you see is a female centaur giving birth. The stables themselves are all life-size. Um, they're in a state of disrepair, the walls are peeling. The title of the work, We Walked the Earth, in the past tense, these, these mythical creatures. And certainly in a Western context, the centaur, horse body, human um, torso is, is a very, very well-known one. But we regard it as a mythology, something in the past, something, this is just a story. In this particular iteration, it's clear that the stables that held the centaurs have been broken out from. The doors are damaged. The metalwork is wrought apart. And if you turn back to the female centaur and you look at her attempt, it's unsure whether she's still giving birth or she's died in the act of giving birth. And whether the creature that is being born or was being born is a foal or a human or a hybrid. As I say, the, 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 the sculptural rendering of these forms was quite remarkable and, and, and very visceral. Moving into the next stable, one finds her partner. And he has been hanged, or else he's hanged himself. And this rift here, this, this, because they're, they're almost like, they're almost like a good-looking couple, but the disruption on them is the disruption in a sense we have wrought upon them. So as I passed a woman on, on one of my walks in the, in the woods yesterday in the forest, and there was a, a mother saying to her little one, oh, this is for the fairies. And how we keep stories alive, but at a certain point we cut the stories off then it's only for children. It's, it, it no longer has veracity. 
We tell those stories, but we don't believe them. And a part of this exhibition, one of the posters was this, the women surrealists aim to re-educate through re-enchantment, seizing upon the fairy figures of the crone, the siren, the sphinx, these are all female figures of power, the hermit can be either, or femme arbre, the female tree, the tree dryad, the spirit, as well as offering a new male imago, the monsieur Venus. These places where boundaries begin to open up and to cross and to separate, and the things that we're sure of and we're no longer necessarily so sure. So storytelling is a way of configuring and reconfiguring worlds. Um, narratives can bring new realities into being. It's not an accident in the environmental movement now that people are going back to storytelling because people can hear stories. You can give them all the data about climate change and it just, you just don't know what to do with it. People don't understand it. It just looks like numbers and figures, graphs and grids, doesn't have any purchase. You start telling stories and it's the knowledge within stories that this, this particular exhibition was trying to bring to the fore. So I'm going to say, have a break now. We've done an hour. Well done. <laughs> you might need to move. So I'll give you, I'll give you five, five, 10 minutes, walk around. It's always good to get the blood flowing, get yourself another glass of wine, and then we'll start again for the last 45 minutes.
three, four, five, and then the monster made up their own total. Coming. coming. Is it coming? Are we getting better? Are we, are we finding purchase? Yeah. Oh, we are. There we go. Yeah. Sorry, we do. I have, I'm, I'm rushing you a little bit because we have apparently load shedding at 10. So <laughs> we need to get the pictures in. <laughs> um, OK, so I, I spent a considerable amount of time sort of referring to Carrington's book to lay the groundwork for then moving a little, a little faster. But just to keep in mind that taking note of the implications of stories and the kinds of stories that you might otherwise dismiss, slowing down and noticing is part of the practice of being in touch with your world. Um, understanding lost knowledge, finding and seeking. And then the, I, when I was with the, um, in, the, in the installation of the centaurs, I saw, I took, a, I took an image, which I'm going to show you is not necessarily, um, not necess it's, it's, it's my interpretation, I took the image for a certain reason. So I'm not wanting to necessarily impugn or implicate the young person who's in the image, but it was something that um, struck me that you would be doing an activity in a space where there was a deeply emotional um, element in the room and, you, and, and, and the person involved is not taking um, any notice of it. Uh, so I, 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 thought this was, I thought this was a portrait of our world. That we disappear into our phones and we lose the magic that's around us. And um, that's something that we have to be really careful of. So Carrington's centaur beast, many-legged creature with cats for epaulets and an umbrella for a tail. Well, I went to the academia um, on the third day that I was there. And that's full of wonderful Renaissance and medieval paintings. And then I found, I found this one, which I thought was completely beautiful. I've never seen this particular image before. And the details of it, look at that richness of imagination. These are part of our heritages, but we've actually, even in the West, they're part of our heritage. And we've tended again to dismiss. So within the exhibition, there were really a rather a lot of images of artists collaborating, working together, and making books. And this was one of the ones as well. Um, Claude Caon and Lisa de Arme wrote, made a little book called The Queen of Spades, and de Arme wrote all the poems, and Caon took the photographs, or rather made the little dioramas or little, little activities to illustrate or to accompany, not necessarily illustrate, accompany the poems. And I thought they were lovely. I thought the little image on the left, this strange bird creature looking at a flower, and particularly this one of the tree where the crows or birds are little pen nibs on the branches. And the hill in, in which the, the tree is is a, is, a, is a pile of feathers. And the idea, of course, of the writer and the telling of narratives is also embedded in an image like that. So, um, Siobhan Laddy talks about this need to storytell and questions the Spears, Spears phallic form, the murderous logic, where Le Guin, and I made that reference earlier to Le Guin's uh, carrier bag of fiction, is the, the movement there is Le Guin says, perhaps the idea of the man going out with his spear and killing and bringing back is not the first story. Perhaps the first story is that whatever we go out and we seek, we have to bring back in something in a bag, in a box, in a container. Um, and the story of the, the sling and the shell and the gourd is part of that. It was one of the guiding texts of the Biennale, and it, it, its ramifications are made in both the Giardini and the Arsenale. And we'll look a little bit at that um, also in the, next, in the next talk. But the other historical capsule on the Giardini was this one the core obit, which was dedicated largely to female producers of what is generally known as concrete poetry. And concrete poetry is, is a really rather lovely form of poetry where the way the words are disported on the page in some kind of way relate to the content of the, of the poem. 
So to be very simplistic about it, you might say there's a poem about jumping. And the words would then move across the page or be placed on the page in a manner that seems to replicate the idea of a jump. And um, there were many different forms in this exhibition. This exhibition was a little bit of a recapitulation of an, of an exhibition that had been produced in 1978. Um, an all-female group of concrete poetry writers, and when it was brought out in 1970, or was put on in 1978, it was described as a pink ghetto. You know, all-female presentation, pink, etc. Um, an indication of the disparagement that very often female practitioners have had to deal with, and that was in the newspaper um, critique. In this particular iteration of it, there are a number of books, and quite interestingly, some of those books are produced by um, spiritualists. Um, this one um, by Houghton, uh, Georgina Houghton, is regarded now by scholars as possibly the very first um, abstraction in Western art production. She didn't really produce it as a painter or a painter who was producing work for a public terrain. She produced it as a way of representing her experiences of spiritual trances, and it's full of abstraction. And it, these drawings came out in the 1860s and 1870s, many years before Malevich, Kandinsky, and all the gentlemen that have been accredited with the introduction of uh, abstraction to the Western art world. Um, in fact, there have been a number of women unearthed as part of the vocabulary of abstraction prior to Malevich and Kandinsky. Uh, Hilma Klint is one of them. Um, she produced the first, her first abstract painting in 1906, which was at least four years before Malevich's Black Square. So again, um, these are all up for, for re-evaluation. Some of the pages from the book. And some of the poetry, the, the, the concrete poetry, I thought these were particularly beautiful and given that the, the moon is, uh, is a bit of a, a central tenant to this talk, I thought these were lovely. The core loon, the one on the right, is you might just be able to see, I'm not sure, those, those of you at the back may battle, but there is the word C-O-R-P, and of course it's that arc, and there's the word loon, so it's, a, it's the arc of the moon. This is another set where the names of plants, um, for Scythia, for instance, here, every word, F-O-R, becomes the branch. And then the, then the word itself travels up there, and the plant grows out of its own word. Um, the telling of stories, the growing of things, they appear throughout the exhibition. Paula Rego, who I mentioned earlier, she was given a very big space with a lot of work in it and uh, whispering stories, telling narratives. But in her work, the narratives and the stories are always have this slightly disturbing edge to them. Here is the blue fairy whispering into Pinocchio's ear. And the idea sounds like it could be quite a nice one, but there's a certain sense of unease in this relationship with this little naked boy and this looming female figure. Rego is known for her kind of masculinity of her female figures. This is um, uh, an image, this is part of an image, again, of this close proximity, the passing of information from an adult to a younger person. And it's, it's uh, Snow White and her stepmother. Different parts, I'm going to reveal the, the, the work in different sections because the, the balance that is being implicated by the, or given by the Snow White on the, on the left of the image is because of this. And one wonders what kind of knowledge is being passed on through generations of women to women. Of course, Rego is known for her engagement with um, relationships, sexual relationships of really quite a brutal nature. And some of her later work in its form, I mean, these drawings are incredibly well formed, but she moved into sculpture in, in some of her later practice. And this is one of the works from her later work. One of, uh, of seven deadly sins, and you'll recognize one of the dolls without the head from the earlier section of this talk. 
And this is, this is a female figure devouring children, eating children. And made in a manner which is really quite clumpy and, and, and clumsy and brutal in its own making. And there was, uh, I remember hearing somebody when they were in the space going, but you know, is this, is this art? Is this, this is ugly, this is not nice, this is, and it kind of, Rego had a, Rego was brought up in Portugal and, and was brought up on Portuguese uh, fairy stories, um, but she also spent much of her working life in Britain and got a residency at the National Gallery in London where she was charged with responding to the iconic works on the wall in the National Gallery. So she's really, really, really well versed in, in the canon of Western painting. And uh, just to give you a kind of sense of the link here and the fact that these kinds of subjects or the subjects that break the boundaries of, so we say, politeness maybe, have been around for a while. Those of you who know your Goya, this is Saturn eating his children. It's a particularly violent image. And this is another agoya of, of eating, which has very strong um, stylistic um, relationships. Of course, Goya in, is, is another figure that does kind of come up in the exhibition. This is a very famous work from Los Caprichos uh, called The Sleep of Reason Produces Monsters. And it's, uh, the critics have always wrestled with the title of this work because it can be read in two ways. The sleep of reason produces monsters. Could be if you let your reason sleep, the monsters will take over. In other words, you need reason to govern the world, otherwise the monsters will take over. Or that reason itself is a form of sleep and will produce monsters. And in the exhibition, it seems the latter translation of that title is very, very much more one of the concerns, is that if you use logic, you, you dismiss so much that you then, the world begins to run amok. In the Rego, there are, there's this kind of altarpiece. It's a, it's a many paneled one. And it's probably one of the, the most curious and abject altarpieces that's, that I've ever seen. In the center panel, there are these, these figures, uh, sort of nurses, children. And I draw your attention to the figure on the left which, again, is a very abject um, child, man, mannequin, and has echoes in art history of depositions, the dead Christ. In this case, the dead Christ in Rego's rendition is a, is a, is a dead child man. It is, again, it's a kind of in-between figure. And if you look at the other kinds of references to depositions, you'll see that the body itself is that's what's being evoked. Further into the image, there's this one in Rego's, and she's holding, this figure is holding this child by the ankle, completely and utterly unconcerned, uh, uh, unfeeling towards that child. And again, there are traditions within Western, um, the canon of Western painting that speak to that. Um, the Judgment of Solomon is a very well-trod area in the, in the language of painting. Solomon, of course, was brought um, a particular problem, these two women had a child and both claimed to be the mother. And there was no agreement on this. And so Solomon's answer was, well, cut the child in half, have half each. And of course, the real mother relinquished the child, not wanting for the child to die. Whereas the unreal mother went, no, it's fine, that's a really good solution because that'll, then, then she can't have it either. Um, so that kind of space of brutality, and then Delacroix's Medea, there are many, you know, in literature and in painting and so on, a woman who was scorned by her husband who went and had an affair, um, and she'd already borne him, I think, 14 sons, um, chooses to slay two of them. So a woman's scorn and the violence within those spaces. Also central to the exhibition is the issue of female pregnancy, female sexuality, the vulva, um, bearing, and also raping, um, being raped. So again, a, a trigger warning for the, for the next image, which is a drawing from a Brazilian artist who is referencing the, the um, tendency of slave masters to use their slaves or their workers both to be wet nurses to their own children, but to also bear the next labor force. 
So the right over the female body by the master of the plantation to rape and to produce another child that would then later be a laborer and the women being forced into this place where they both have to suckle and um, also support what they know is the master's property. It's um, the kinds of really entangled relationships of body here. And these drawings, these drawings are not that big, they're about that small um, and incredibly um, brittle and uh, raw. So the vulva, uh, female genitalia, rears large in the Giardini exhibition. The, the previous one was from the Arsenale. Um, this particular artist, Oratachi, was, um, and it's, the, the text was unclear, but was born Louis Marcusen, or rather, that was the gender they were designated. It's not clear whether there, what kinds of options the body um, was, was showing, but male you will be. And Overtachi, which was a self-adopted name later, and I'll speak a little bit about that just now, um, resisted that, saw herself as a female. And this led to some very difficult, in fact, some appallingly difficult periods in her life. But as I say, the, the vulva, the aperture, the portal, the space of opening, the place of birthing, and the space of violence was throughout the exhibition. These, this, these were parts of these rope, um, Arabic rope knotted totemic figures um, very strong female forms. I've given you an idea of the scale of them by the little inset there. Um, Indian artist from um, Delhi. And so throughout the exhibition, there were, there's a lot of bodily forms, a lot of spaces and containers, and s a lot of in, in a form that was not necessarily directly clear, but evocative nonetheless. I thought this conjunction with a marble peach pip was, was quite a remarkably disturbing one and difficult to find one's way through. To return to Avatarchi though, Avatarchi means chief lunatic. She took on the term chief lunatic because she went away into the world as a man, um, very unhappy with this designation and tried to do self-surgery and then was committed um, to an institution on the basis of that madness and um, ended up spending 57 years the rest of her life in this institution. She managed after eight years of fighting for her right to be a female to be in fact given um, the necessary surgical uh, changes which allowed her to be who she wanted to be but she remained in an institution for her life. Um, so she was kind of the chief lunatic. Uh, a tossie is a colloquial term for a patient in a psychiatric hospital. And one of the things that Avatarchi did was when they were in, they, 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 she painted, she drew, she made objects, she made sculptures, and she made these quite curious semi-life-size dolls out of um, fabric and, and paper. And I became aware of their hands, the, 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 the fragile and, and frayed nature of the hands. Now, clearly, over time, they've got worse, but they became very evident in, the, in these, these figures. And of course, the hand is the place of touch. The hand is the place which we, we move out into the world, we feel the world, and we draw the world towards us. And so if your hands are frayed, if your being is frayed, if you cannot touch the world properly as you would like, it becomes a place of extreme distress and um, dislocation. These figures were um, curated in such a way that they looked onto a wall of some of the most extraordinary small paintings that were incredibly, um, uh, I don't even want to call them photorealistic because they, 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 they moved beyond that. They were incredibly close renditions of various elements of the body. Some of them you could see sort of head and shoulders, but others you could only see a fragment, part of a neck, um, the freckles on a back, and the surface engagement of, of the brush to evoke that skin almost made the canvas itself tactile in a, in a, in a skin-like way. I'll show you a detail here. It's 
So it was almost like the, it no longer was, a, was, a, was an image. It was a surface that was resonating with the idea of skin. And it was, I thought the juxtaposition was really interesting because, of course, it's this place, skin is the place that is, that is, our, is our porous boundary. It's the place between the inside and the outside. But it's not, a, it's not a strict boundary because what we touch, we feel inside. And so, again, you've got this inside-outside thing. And particularly evident was in this little painting that I just found completely fascinating of Goosebumps. And I'll show you a detail of this one. And you could actually see the little hairs sticking up. Now, this painting's like this size. Once the idea of surface, and surface as porous, and surface as the place of the in-between was, um, was awoken, in a sense, in my head by looking at these, I began to look around again at what was, I was surrounded by. And in the opening, the opening room, there was this work um, by Rosemary Trockel, who used to make uh, knitting with machines, but has now gone back to, to knitting by hand. She works with a number of different people. And the idea of this surface, this surface of making, this surface of touch, this, and also in these particular cases, this is called a color assistant. And if you look closely at it, what you'll realize is that it's got a perspex um, frame, and the light falls through it, and what it does is it escapes the frame. The color escapes onto the wall, and the moment the orange, the red-orange sienna color escapes onto the wall, you start seeing the color of the shadow differently. It goes lilac, it goes green, it takes on another kind, because your eyes begin to hold a different optical response to that. So that's why it's a color assistant. And I like the idea that these boundaries, again, were being crossed by light this time. This, this red color, which, as I told you, I picked up by, when I was making my little drawings, and I was thinking, this color keeps cropping up, um, was also in a, in, a, in a sculpture in the room next door to these. Um, and this hybrid creature, many-breasted, we know there are many-breasted creatures in, in mythologies, um, strange, bunny-like, long-eared female figure, clearly, again, the idea of the body, female body is being fertile. As you get closer to it, you begin to see it slightly differently because it is made from pantyhose that have been stuffed with tobacco. And one of the reasons it's done like this is because tobacco um, is, in, in, the, in the indigenous tradition there, a shared or exchange gifting reciprocal economy. It's not a monetary economy, it's its own currency. Tobacco originally was its own currency. We, of course, from the West came over and we took over it and we capitalized on it and we, we, made, we made our money from it. And we changed its currency, literally, into something that is not a gift, is not a reciprocation. You have to pay for it. And these, once again, are the bodies of, of, of female um, indigenous peoples who find themselves then under the, the lash of a different kind of um, ownership, a colonial ownership. So colonization and the decolonial uh, dialogues of this current moment also arose in these areas. And accompanying this, this, this um, hybrid creature were these little collage places, um, the pull string on a, on a, from an from a, uh, aluminum can, little bits of detritus that had been picked up, kind of treated like precious coins because actually that original space of, of the natural world being the place where you exchange is being replaced by the throwaway. So these little collages, they're beautiful, but they're complex in their, um, in their implications. In the major room, one of the major artists, Vicunia, Vicunia is a Chilean artist who's been making activist environmental art for many, many years. Also a poet, um, edited one of the, the Oxford Book of Latin American Poetry, and started off by making these kind of imaginative paintings. And here you might recognize one of the eyes that was, was earlier on the, uh, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the images. And this is a portrait of her mother. But she's the one as well who had the many, many uh, armed woman. And this particular one is a, an image of a goddess eating people in order to fertilize the world. 
These paintings were not able to be seen without some level of distraction. Because if one stepped, I've taken these photographs quite close, but actually if you step back, there's always something in front. Because in the room, the room was full of objects that were hanging. And the, the exhibition for Vicunia, who was, a, who was kind of one of these celebrated uh, life achievement, Golden Lion life achievement artists, was both her uh, retrospective, but also her contemporary practice. And when she arrived in Venice, she had all her historical work, but she had no work for the exhibition. She made the work for the exhibition in Venice by walking along the edges of the lagoon and picking up all sorts of bits and pieces, bits of grass, bits of plastic. And this became part of a very fragile hanging environment, which was very difficult to photograph. The paintings on the far wall are not hers. They're another artist. Um, but every time you looked at a painting from the past, you had, a, you had this kind of visual uh, disturbance. So there was this one, for instance. But actually, you were looking through all of this stuff to see it. And you could look right up. These spaces are large. And you could look right up into the top and see, as I say, bits of plastic and rope. And, and for her, she called the piece a, a naufrage. Um, from the word navis, ship, and fragere, to break, or fragile. And she said it was her statement about our inability to, to take care of the earth, our failure to take care of the earth. And what she's doing is she's asking you to, to, to slow down. You literally walk through the spaces and you're almost, you're almost having to do that. And there are tiny, tiny details. For those of you who are interested in such things, she's now got a massive show up at the, um, in the London, uh, the, uh, the new Tate. I'll show you that just now. So there go. she's got this, this installation, which is meters and meters and meters of rope tying, which also is about storytelling. Um, the uh, Kwipu, an ancient measuring, recording, and communication system of knotted textile cords. Uh, these are ways of recording history, telling stories that fills the Unilever um, turbine gallery at the Tate. Tate Modern. Going back to Venice, we did have a South African artist who was also working um, Brahmin cats uh, from Cape Town. And um, she had this river bed, a bed that was made up of uh, spot scourers and springs and is meant to speak to the presence of the water snake that exists mythologically in so many rivers in Africa. And in, in fact, not just Africa, across the world. The rivers are often occupied by powerful river snakes. And the room itself was about, um, uh, was surrounded by, if you'll just go back to that, you'll see it maybe just make out on the walls on the left-hand image that there were these big drawings and big ink drawings and prints of the relationship between people and our landscape and environment, which was a key aspect of the exhibition, though took place largely in the Arsenale, where artists took advantage of the extraordinarily large spaces. So this particular piece by um, Okiyaman, to see the earth before the end of the world, particularly resonant um, thing, and also given that most people had not been traveling for three years when they came to this Biennale. But what is the world, and what kind of care do we have to take of it, and what kind of things do we have to notice? Some of the spaces, they were performance artists and performers. And in this particular one, we had two or three performers who had been charged. This is a Pirici performance. In other words, he's the artist, not necessarily the performer. The performers were charged with responding to elements in the environment of the uh, exhibition. So the, the performance itself is called Encyclopedia of Relations. And the artists or the performers were, were picking up on different forms that they <laughs> from that, an 
and I rather liked the way the young gentleman there caught my eye um, as I was photographing him. And of course, these masks were very strange in terms of creating a hybrid creature. And this, in this turn, this upside down creature that looked a bit like a beetle on its back also picked up on a, an image in the Paul Orego show, which is probably one of the most vulnerable images I've seen of a man ever drawn. The upside down creature, the creature on its back, of course, is also certainly within our human history, often the image of a child. We tend to feel more comfortable with a child on, on, on its back. But this particular one um, is not being well cared for. The state of its diapers indicates uh, a lack of care. <clears throat> often there was a bit of a need for a little bit of a, maybe a lighter note. Um, and one was dealing with so many things that, 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 that really reinforced how, how neglectful we are. And so this particular artist um, was interested, Fado Giutini, was interested in the idea that being in the natural world can give you a sense of rebirth. And there's a little space just outside uh, this exhibition space where the Venice Biennale have creepers all the way up the wall. So I'd just been in that space, then I came into this one, and it was like the two were talking to each other. But the artist is fascinated by color and mark and abstraction. Um, I love the title of this one. And that day she remembered how to purr. And this one, which I think summed up the Biennale in many ways, the prolific beauty of our panicked landscape. Closely uh, aligned to that was this one. Never seen such an enormous photograph of a fly, or painting of a fly, artwork of a fly. And uh, it's, it, again, Jana Erler, fly moment. It's, it's, it's a kind of creature that we don't pay attention to. The reason that Damien Hurst could set up a, a particular vitrine where he's got flies in one side, which have to, they're being birthed, and they have to go through an electric tunnel that's an ele that will electrocute them, because it's designed to do that, in order to be fed on the cow's head on the other side. The only thing that allows that to happen is that there is not an SPCA for flies. So, you know, I found myself watching the Damien Hurst piece many years ago and being fascinated. Will the fly make it? Will it make it? Will it make it? Oh, that one just missed it. That one missed it. Oh, look, he got through. And then I thought, I'm being complicit. He drew me in. Yeah. And it's exactly that space where you just go because it doesn't matter if a fly dies. It's what a fly. And so this huge painting, actually it's quite a beautiful painting. Show you just some details. It was set in a room with a very curious um, companion audience. <laughs> Great White Fear. Uh, clearly a, a, a title that has larger resonances than merely the shark. And the flies and the shark were so together. One of the things that I sometimes do when I go on these tours is see how the audience connects inadvertently with the work. <laughs> or perhaps this one. <laughs> it's a bit wicked of me. Um, those are Miriam Kahn's uh, paintings. And the idea of being upside down or free falling or free floating or without being grounded is another thematic that runs through both shows. How do we see the world? What are we looking at? What are we going to do if we don't, if we're not grounded? These big eyes, these irises, huge paintings that take many months to paint. And this particular artist, uh, Ulla Wigan, these iris eyes are the new work. And in the background were her older works, where she was fascinated with um, computer boards and uh, little electronic sections, meticulously painted. Look at these details. And this is part of the dialogue of the cyborg. How do we work with machinery? How do we work with technology? What, how, how animated is it? And the kind of beginnings of pointings towards AI and our, our cross-boundary spaces. 
Then there was a, the, this was also the space where there was the technologies of enchantment, which I didn't spend too much time in, but if I, and there was a lot of visual and optical uh, engagements and light sculptures. But what I thought was really rather a nice combination of the two was this particular piece by Charlotte Johannesson, who's done a lot of uh, tapestries and weavings, and I'm not sure if you'll be able to read that, but um, the brain is wider than the sky is what it says at the top. And I don't know if any of you can read what's underneath that. Some, of, some when when I when I showed it to my students, they could. Um, it's the reverse of it, which of course, if you see it, you see it. The brain is wider than the sky. It's able to do all sorts of extraordinary things, including read backwards. So the body, the augmented body, the adjusted body, the dismembered body, the truncated body, the upset body, the re-put together body, the included body. Um, this little one, which is really elegant in its relationship of, mar of par the par part in the middle is a, is a ceramic. And the element at the bottom on the left-hand image is a teaspoon. And so you get included. That's me trying to photograph the teaspoon. So of course you get included into, into the work. And throughout this section of the exhibition, there were bodies made by all different kinds of artists. This one was a graphic designer, Christina Carles, who's moved into working with, with paintings and employs huge ranges of textures and disruptions and ways of making marks and painting, again, in these elongated, dismembered, reimagined bodies. I was rather intrigued by the two floating breasts um, islands because they were actually not um, coming forward, if you got close, you found that they were in fact on the surface of the canvas and the surround was in fact the sea coming forward. So again, this kind of perception of what is near, what is far. But it also signaled this place, as I say, of the, the beleaguered female body, which was in the next room. Um, I was unaware, it's amazing what we learn in these particular exhibitions, that there are brothels in Germany which only have sex dolls as their um, client servers. And the thing about having sex dolls is a place where men can, um, or clients can enact all sorts of fantasies, which perhaps it is better that it happens on a doll and not a real living person. But the artist was actually drawing attention to the fact that if you have sex dolls and you're running a business, they need to be maintained so they had to be cleaned after every client. And uh, there was this video of called the, the, the maintenance, the maintenancer, where you were given a very graphic and detailed um, documentary filming, but not quite documentary filming, of this engagement with the body, which was very disturbing because the bodies in many cases are, are, are really quite realistic. What you've got in the background is, is this kind of fatigued sort of body of a doll. Um, and of course, the other thing that was quite, a, quite interesting to watch was the audience, because most of the audience were a bit agog. Um, so the body without, going back to the very first room, and this is an image I showed you fairly early on. These are images of the artist's body, and they've been made in, they've been cast, she's been cast, molds, and then she's worked it with other things, the detritus of the world, and it's been made in glass. These are actually lead crystal glass sculptures. Really quite peculiar. You get in there, you see this metamorphosis of the figures. Um, so you used 3D printing and then were finally produced in lead crystal. It takes you time to see them as well. The image on the right, which you might remember was also in that first drawing, um, thing that I was doing, it took me a long time to see the girl doing the shoulder stand. And it takes you time to realize that there are certain parts of the body that actually just are plastic bottles, or would have been. There was one piece that looked really quite classical until you looked around her. And so at this particular point, one's feeling a bit sort of, I suppose, discombobulated by the amount of stuff one's seen. And this little reminder that we've become blind and deaf to the beauty and magic of this world and, and to its creativity. 
and the living organisms that surround us. And that re-enchantment of the world is intimately connected to the notion of the commons. The commons, that which belongs to all of us. Um, that which we used to take for granted, but which is now being monetized. Um, I remember first becoming aware of that when Donald Trump bought the airspace above Trump Towers. He owns the air above Trump Towers. And of course, the battle that is now happening with uh, resources for water, um, people buying up springs, and then of course companies like Nestle selling to us in our, in our plastic bottles and so forth, and that denying the local inhabitants of their water supply and us paying way too much and doing probably what we shouldn't be doing, which is supporting that industry. So at a certain particular point, I sort of staggered out of this exhibition and um, <laughs> I went and looked at the pink glass <laughs> of its different forms in, in Venice. And we've got three minutes before load shedding, so I'm going to call it a halt there. I will be doing part two, 24th, um, which will be focusing on the Arsenale. Anybody have any questions? Or I've exhausted you all and you just need to go home or have a drink or a... Are, are, there, are there questions or are all you all happy beings to chat amongst yourselves? I don't know if you can order more drinks. I don't know whether the bar's still open. Thank you, everybody. We don't need it. They're not going to do it. They, they're all happy to.